Hello everyone, welcome to another sweet uh, Tuesday. Let's jump in with some worship. And Father, we just want to give you this evening. We want to honor you. We want you to be pleased with our offering. So tonight, God, please let this night be a very sweet and yet very powerful one for each of us, God, I pray. Come to worship you, Jesus. I've come to worship you, Lord. I've come to worship you, Jesus. Mm. I've come to worship you, Lord. Yeah.
Jesus, I simplify all of my scattered life, all that I bring to only one King. It's all yours, <clears throat> Holy One, all that I I would have called. I now can see, laid at your feet, Lord, it's yours. And hear my cry as this, I give you my heart. It's open and breaking, can in my life. It's yours for the taking, it's all yours. My cornerstone, counting the cost here at the cross. I am all yours. Let my life's offering be the one song I sing of glory and praise. Be to your name.
I just want to find Just wanna find you, Lord. I just want you. Crushing the world underneath me, Savior, come. Settle my heart is your home. All that I am cries out just to please you. Hush now the harms of heaven and Crushing the world under me, Savior, come. Settle my heart as your home. All that I am cries out just to please you. Hush now the hurls of heaven and
feel alive Make me alive Oh Jesus, breathe your life Make me alive Make me alive Pour out your spirit on me Make me alive Make me alive Oh Jesus, breathe your life Oh Jesus my prayer tonight ignite me god ignite me let your spirit give me life tonight to this mortal shell bring us to that place tonight god i pray where we would find ourselves right where we belong with you in jesus name amen all right friends please run grab your bibles or whatever the case is and we will be right back first peter chapter uh, five Hello everyone. It's really, really lovely to have you back. Um, what a great thing for us to be able to go through God's word like this. Uh, what a sweet, sweet uh, thing. Okay, well let's let's pray one more time. Um, well, let's kind of put some context to what we're reading. Father, I, I just pray that you would ridiculously speak to us today. I mean, in a way that we are so really gripped God I, I know that it's so easy to uh, to just sort of do it and uh, and it's another thing Lord to really be impacted and it's my prayer tonight that we would be very 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 impacted tonight please so have your way if there be any who have yet to know you would tonight please let tonight be the night of their salvation please and tonight, Lord, reduce us to that place where it's just us and you. And let your spirit have his perfect work in each of us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I would say tonight, as I would any, please never just believe me. Never just assume it's true because I say so. Search the scriptures. Let the Bible be your authority, please. All right. We're at the end of the book here. Uh, the fact that this is Peter writing the cheeky cocksure fisherman partners with his brother Andrew and James and John nicknamed the Sons of Thunder he was invited and I'm just kind of giving us a little bit of background again as we kind of close this up he'd been invited by his brother Andrew who was a disciple of John the Baptist who would tell him come see this man could it be the Christ I, I think we found the Christ so Peter does, Simon, by the way, born Simon, and if we would, remember people got their names either by their location or by their parentage traditionally or by their occupation. So that's why we have names like Smith, for instance, because that's their occupation. 
Or you have people that are named, for instance, Mick, like McMahon or McJames or McKinnon, uh, because Mick means son of. And Jesus would call him Simon bar -Yonah. We can assume maybe that his dad's name is Jonah. However, uh, Jesus would say would give him a, a new name. He shows up in, in John 1.42. When he shows up, Jesus gives him a new surname. Remember, that's your last name. So Jesus calls him Simon Petros or Kifas. That's the Aramaic word for Peter, which is the word Greek word for stone, rocky. And in Luke 5, after a miraculous catch of fish, he leaves everything to follow Jesus. Uh, assumedly, uh, he appears to be the elder of the group. Uh, he definitely is the biggest. Uh, we know that from the end of the Gospel of John, when a bunch of guys cannot pull in a large catch of fish, where Peter, on the other hand, does it single-handedly. And he saw perhaps all of, if not most of, uh, the miracles of Jesus. 37 recorded in the Gospels, 23 of them involving healing, 6 involving crowds, 5 involving fish, uh, at least 4 involving exorcisms, at least 3 involving raising dead, uh, at least 2 storms, at least 1 water walking. And Jesus collects this motley ragamuffin, blue collar ragtag people that would have naturally been at odds with each other and built a family with them. He knows the bravado of the I will never leave you and this reliance on his own personal strength. And I assume being a sort of a big guy, perhaps, as at least tradition says of him, that he knows how to rely on his strength and get someplace to some degree. But he also knows the breathtaking face plant of self and self-loathing at his denying Christ thrice. He knows the restoration of dignity at Jesus who would turn to him and say then, if you really do love me, shepherd my sheep. So he knows the fire and the fury of his youth. He knows the pitfalls of pride and the overestimation of personal power. He knows the critical might of God's Holy Spirit getting them over themselves and acts. And Peter will go to places he never expected. For instance, he brings the gospel to a centurion in Acts chapter 10, has to defend himself in chapter 11 for it, is arrested by religious leaders in Jerusalem in chapter 12, released by God, and then is called to testify again uh, in regards to the salvation and, and what's burden to place upon, what religion, what tradition to place upon the Gentiles as they're now turning to Christ in chapter 15 of the book of Acts. And then really, for the most part, he disappears then from the book of Acts. Sometime after that, we know that he shows up in Syria, Antioch. And we know that because when Paul writes in Galatians 2, Paul had to rebuke him for, in essence, playing favorites with the Jews, the traditional Jews of the church in Antioch. So somewhere after this point. Now, by 54 AD, Nero begins to reign and will do so for 14 years. Uh, and then things get really heavy. Uh, James, he, uh, John's brother had died 10 years before that. Uh, Matthew now dies in about 60 AD in Ethiopia. Uh, his brother, Simon Peter's brother, Andrew, will be crucified in Greece in the same year in 60 AD. And in 64 AD, four years later, the Rome will catch fire at Nero's hand. He will blame Christians for it, and Peter will be arrested. Somewhere in all of that, Peter is writing these letters, and it is fairly likely to assume Peter may have thought that this was the last letter he would write. Now, there are traditions that, that go as early as 96 AD. I believe that is Clement who, um, of Rome who writes to Corinth and says that Peter and Paul were our apostles in Rome. Ignatio of uh, Antioch would write in 107 a letter to Rome, and he says, I'm, I command you as Peter and Paul did. So, so there is strong, at least if nothing else, strong, very, very, uh, very, very current uh, church father activity that states Peter to be in Rome. Uh, we have no record of him going east. So when he speaks of Babylon, it's likely to assume that he probably means Rome, uh, which because of the prophecies Jesus had spoken of um, and him looking at Babylon from the Old Testament, seeing it as a place of just a cesspool of debauchery, I can see why he would call it that. Nonetheless, he's writing to Christians hammered in their faith and he knows the arrest, the accusation and abuse firsthand. 
Uh, and, and really, the focus now is you're going to suffer now, but there will be glory later. And he speaks about wives and husbands, the mature, about how the mature to step up and shepherd, just like Peter was taught to shepherd. Uh, and with that, now he turns to the youth in these final verses. Now, it is important to recognize, I remind, I remind you that Peter, if he were to look back at his own youth in Christ, it's sort of a two-step dance of boasting and then bombing. Boasting about his own strength, bombing out of showing the weakness of his own strength. He's older now. And now he's kind of watched it take down many. And, and he watched people who have failed and then failed and then walked away from their faith as a result of it. And he does not want that to be you. So hear me as I walk up to this, verse 8. And it'll say this, by the way, again, in, like, in verse 5 to get there. Likewise, you young people, submit to your elders. Yes, you all be submissive to one another. Be clothed with humility because God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. And therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting your care all your care upon him because he cares for you. And this is sort of the preface for this verse, verse 8. He's speaking to young people that would be natural to be headstrong and cocksure, much like Simon Peter was. And therefore he says in verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. Notice verse 9, it says, Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood. In the world now it is amazing where people will take these verses and i just want to be true to what it says in our previous verses i remind you he's speaking to young people although we can clearly say that there's some form of application for all of us in this but i want to remind you those who were with us last week as we looked at first john it spoke about children young men and fathers in first john and it spoke about the children being those whose sins were forgiven for his name's sake and who've met the Father. They know God. And then it speak of, spoke of the fathers as they've known him who was from the beginning. They know Jesus. But that young men section, that adolescent, that sort of men in their prime, it says that you are strong, you've overcome the wicked one, and the word of God lives in you. That's important to recognize that if you're in a place where the, the wicked one is still wreaking that type of havoc in your life, the adversary, at that point, then clearly we have not graduated to the place of at least sort of strong prime adolescence in our walks with Christ. Because he says that that should be a telltale sign. Now, let's talk about what it is and what it isn't. And really, all we have to do is look at the verses that are actually here. Because we can talk about, oh, the devil's made me sick and the devil's trying to make me poor. And, and you know, it's, and, and there are, these can be tools to be used, but please understand that this is not what he's talking about. He's not saying that, wow, you know, if you're not alert, if you're not aware and you're not ready, the devil is going to make you poor and he's going to give you COVID. That is not what he is saying here because we'll see the context in verse 9. Verse 8 says, be sober. Now, he's writing to the young men, I remind you, to, to people who are not adults in their faith. And the word sober shouldn't be a surprise to us. Nepho is the word. It literally means to be wine-free. Now, without taking it in any metaphorical condition whatsoever, if we just read that by itself, how would we respond to that? This is Peter, as an elder, calling himself a fellow elder. And he says in verse 8, Be sober. And he tells us why as this continues on, but understand, he says, this is the state we need to be in. And he tells us two very distinct things. And the first is, you cannot not be sober and expect this thing to go well for you with the adversary. Now, there are all kinds of things from Christian wine tasting, and I don't want to diss people who want to, in essence, glory and the luxury of their freedom in Christ. But there's somewhere where we start to grow in our faith, where we start to be governed more by whether it edifies others more than just whether I have the freedom to do it. As Paul would say, all things are benef are, I'm sorry, all things are permissible, but not everything edifies. Now, one way or the other, and then again, I'm not here to dish you, but I can tell you, for me, I take this verse very seriously. And he says, you need to be sober. You need to be wine-free. Second, to be vigilant. 
The word vigilant is the word gregorejo. It's where, if you're familiar with the Gregorian monks, that's where they get the term from. Gregorejo literally means to keep awake. Now, mm, sorry, this is a good cup of tea. Mm. Thank you, Lord, for a good cuppa. Thank you that it doesn't say in Scripture, be tea free. All right. We don't have any record of Peter having any issues with alcohol. Now, I don't know whether he did or not, but I can tell you this. Peter certainly knows the issue of vigilance because Jesus would say thrice at his arrest, could you not stay awake with me for one hour, Peter? I'm speaking specifically to the one who said, I would never, I would never bail on you. I would never fail you. Oh, yeah, I would expect it from the rest of these guys. But, oh, you'd not expect it from me, Lord. And, and here I'd like you to recognize, Peter says, you got to recognize what happens when we are not vigilant. And why it is so imperative for us to be sober-brained, and why it is so important for us to be awake, alert, because your adversary, ante dikos, um, and for what it's worth, dikos means right, so it literally means one who stands against what is right. Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking who he may, katarino, and katarino, katapino, literally means to gulp down. So he is looking to swallow people whole. And, he's, and, and by the way, and we'll talk just a moment about that, but I'd like you to recognize verse 9. It says, resist him. By the way, it's a great word for resist. Anti, again, I remind you, means to stand against or to be against. Histami, histami mean, literally means to stand. So when you take an antihistamine, it literally means something that stands against your runny nose. That's kind of the idea. That's actually the word that's here. So be an antihistamine, antihistamine, to the devil. Stand against him. Take your stand and be alert, be sober, and be steadfast. Look at verse 9. Be steadfast in the faith. The word steadfast is the word stereos, and it literally means to be stiff, uh, solid, and stable, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Now, put this together for a moment. It tells us, first of all, the state we need to be in, I remind you, to be sober and to be vigilant. Why? Because you have an adversary who is hungry and he's looking to gulp down. But he tells us this is how we resist him. We solid up, we stable up our what in verse 9? Take a look at what verse 9 says. Stay steadfast in the faith. I'd like you to, to understand the MO of your opposition, the marching orders. The goal is to get you to give up, to quit, to bail on this walk, to forfeit this faith. What does he use? Well, if I go all the way back to the book of Genesis, I see the enemy speaking to someone who has secondhand information about the word of God. That's Eve in chapter 3 of Genesis. Did God really say that? And he starts by sowing doubt, bringing division, using deception, outright denial. And with all of that, Sowing in this discord and discouragement to get a person to, to take into their own hands what their rebellion. Now, please understand that if you were a sheep, as God speaks of us being sheep, and here, of course, warning the older men, challenging, exhorting, admonishing the older men to be shepherds. The purpose for dividing, if you've ever watched any of those animal programs, the purpose for dividing is to isolate. The purpose to isolate is to devour. And it always seems to happen. It always seems like for whatever reason, no matter what show you watch on animals feasting, there's always going to be lions and wildebeests or water buffalo. Have you noticed that? 
and and it always so it seems like it doesn't matter what it is it always seems to go to this thing and then it's or it's the one with the zebras where you watch and it always it seems like of course the lion or cheetah is sort of the the predator in this and with that it goes right into the middle of the thing and then it just they become two parties that's the first place that happens they become two parties now what that shows is that they are dividable and as they are dividable, even like the enemy speaking to Eve while Adam is there, not addressing both, but specifically her. He divides and splits. If he can do that in a marriage, if he can do that in a ministry, and there are so many right now hot topics to just split people in half. And if he can do that, then he can start to isolate. And if he can isolate, then he can start to devour. And you watch. Right goes right through the middle. They start to split into two groups. And then it goes after one of those two those groups until one of those animals, the zebra or the water buffalo or whatever, all of a sudden it starts to isolate, come by itself. And then that, of course, you know is going to be dinner. And God does not want you to be Satan's dinner. What would it look like to be Satan's dinner? Well, notice what he says. He says, resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in all the world. He goes, look it. In this, this is the tool he's using at this moment with this group. They're getting hammered for their faith. They're starting to feel like they're somehow some form of freak for it. Maybe somehow they're being punished, but they don't even understand for what kind of like Job's friends laying on them or whether it being that somehow they just feel like this is so unjust and so unfair because somehow in all of this, <clears throat> I've been trying to live for God, but somehow it's still I'm getting fired and still she's breaking up with me and still somehow in it, my neighbors are being nasty to me and still somehow in it, I'm not as popular as I used to be. I'm not as cool as I used to be or whatever the case is. And now all of a sudden we're in this place where People are firing us and making our lives miserable and putting us in prison, not because we're doing something that is even civilly disobedient, but rather just because we claim to love the one that they hate. And he says, listen, what Satan wants to do, to if Satan were to devour you, you would somehow assume that your suffering is so freaking unique that clearly God must not love you, and therefore serving God is futile and it really kind of looks like this. Your first line of defense is the enemy comes at you. And again, here we are in military terms, taking our stand against him. We line up. What is our first line of defense? It is our shield. And our shield, according to Ephesians chapter 6, is our shield of faith. So here's our first thing. If he can get you to drop your shield, then you are vulnerable. Having fought competitively, not for a big portion of my life, but for enough to understand it, one of the first things you start to look for is a person drop their guard. When you're coming, mean, there's always a hand to block and always a hand to throw. You want to make sure that no matter whatever's coming at you, there's some way to block it, but then there's always a hand to kind of, there should be a good offense, uh, sorry, offense and defense. And the reason I say that is, is that the moment that those hands come down, and you'll hear that term, as soon as his hands are down, his face says, punch me, knock me out. And this is what happens when our faith starts to fall. So the first thing that happens is time brings discouragement because it isn't happening like you wanted it to, or somehow God gave you this much information, you filled in the rest with exactly how that fantasy is to play out now versus what God gave in his will. And now your fantasy isn't playing out, God's will still will. But in there, you're like, man, this is just not the way I expected it. This is discord, and this is disruptive, and this is uncomfortable and inconvenient, and it is expensive, and this is challenging, and this is not easy. And somewhere in all of that, you get, you get discouraged. And as you get discouraged, your hands start to come down. And once your hands start to come down, that discouragement will make you weary. It will make you tired and to the point and what happens is hear me on this as the shield comes down you start to lose hope all of a sudden these big dreams and these magnificent ideas of a huge god that created everything and still has these great plans for you specifically 
Now all of a sudden you start going, oh man, that's probably for someone else. And now with that in mind, our shield starts to drop. We start to catch him on the chin. And with that now, we start to lose hope. And the moment we start to lose hope, what we're showing is that our faith is vulnerable and the enemy has a foothold for a takedown. And then third, as we lose hope, we start to look at what we're doing as futile. And as we look at it as futile and meaningless, we start to ask, what's the, why am I even doing this anyways? Nothing's changing. Nothing good is coming about from this. Why am I even doing this? And you can see why, because this is all a head game, why he tells us you need to be sober and vigilant. Because if you are in any way predisposing your brain to not thinking clearly under whatever terms those would be, even if that be that you just saturated yourself with all kinds of worldly things as distractions, you're still not in the right headspace for this kind of battle. Well, the enemy is still looking at it at a point like that. You really need to have your head clear because when he comes at you, you need to take your stand and that, that shield must come up and you must have the word of God in your hand because it is also a defensive weapon, that sword of the word of God. And that sword is so that if somehow the enemy gets past your shield, he gets to the point of being at your shield and he's pushing on it, that sword tells him that if you give him the point, things change radically. But if we drop our sword, our shield, chances are we probably don't have that sword in our other hand either. And then what happens is we start to go, oh, and we isolate. And here these people are starting to go, wow, this is my thing and it's just me and nobody's going to understand this. And, you know, why do I even, I, there's no, if I just told you, you would just go oh, and you'd roll your eyes again and you just think this one more time. And, you know, it's like, and you could just see how the enemy is just, he's, he's giving free tickets to his performance and you have taken his seats. No, please understand in this. God does not want this. Peter does not want this. Certainly God does not want this. It's like, it is time to sober up. It is time to get vigilant. And it's time to wake up, sober up and wake up. Because there is an enemy. But here's the good news. You can stand victorious over him in every battle. Now, here's the thing. I'm not telling you that Satan's the one giving you a flu. I'm not telling you he's not. But I'm telling you this. That Satan wants to use it to discourage you. I'm not telling you that Satan's the one that's behind you losing your job. God may actually be the one getting you out of your workplace to get you in a better place. But he's, Satan is definitely behind the one trying to discourage you and get you to give up. And when you watch a generation of people who are killing themselves one after another, people that were close friends of mine that had everything the world had to offer, that then just still took their life into their own hands, you watch that kind of thing. And you realize it is the ultimate victory for the enemy. Because what more could you give up than that? I get why Paul would say in 2 Timothy 4, 7, as he's ready to die, I've fought the good face. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Paul looks and he saw all these other people who've, whose faith has been shipwrecked, people who have bailed for other places because they love the present world more than God. And he's He's, these were people that he stood with. They were OGs with him. They were people he fought with, not against. He fought with. They stood side by side, shield to shield, and took on places that were horribly hostile. And yet somehow in all of that, he looks, and, and somehow the dust starts to settle, and all of these people in the army have somehow bailed on him. And he looks, and he's like, wow. Remember when this was a big thing? Remember when we were a movement? Remember when we were the thing that other things quaked and feared over? What is this? Paul would say that all of Asia has deserted me. Asia Minor, the west coast, Anatolia, the west, uh, western side of Turkey, would have appeared to be Paul's greatest accomplishment. When he was in Ephesus for three years, which, by the way, was one of the capitals of Asia Minor, it said that all of Asia heard the word of God. Could you imagine what that would be like? It would be like saying all of South Bay has heard the word of God. All of Los Angeles has heard the word of God. Because of a guy setting up shop in some little place on the coast. 
and seeing churches burst and crazy cool things happen and then some and all of that the dust starts to settle and it's like they've become pubs they've become theaters they've become community centers how discouraging would that be and you can imagine the enemy really roaring what does his roar sound like it's not like something from the exorcist. His war is like, give up. You are worthless. You have no part of this. It would be better if you weren't here. It would be better if you gave up and left. You're getting in the way. That's the roar of the enemy. Identify it as that and then take your stand, beloved, like you should. And this is, I want you to recognize, and this is where it starts, what you are experiencing, the world of Christians are experiencing too in their own way. So you can still lock arms with them. You can lock arms with other people who are struggling, which just tells you that how, how does an animal get back to its safety? It needs to get back to the flock where there is a place for them to be safe in a group of other people that go, you know what, we all deal with that to whatever degree. But we all can say as we open up the word of God, that is a lie. And God is not done with you. If God were done with you, he'd say that's your last breath and he'd take you home. And if you are still breathing, then the mission is still active. Let's move on. But can I just say, please, Please do not just jump over that. Because we're going to see one of the people that's a perfect example of that at the end of this. Verse 10 and 11. But may the God of all grace, who called us to eternal his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory of and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. To perfect, katartizo, means to complete, to establish, sterizo. It's where we get the word steroid from. The idea of establishing is that you are buffed to the point of being immovable. Strengthen, snenajo, means to be something solid, to, uh, and then to confirm, then to settle, uh, that's one of those fun words, Themeliahu. Themeliahu means to lay a foundation and have things proper in it. We might say like a building that is properly retrofit, or better yet, is properly settled from the beginning, where everything is properly supported and strengthened, the house is going to handle it. And he goes, this is what's supposed to happen. Now understand, just because you're in something like this does not mean God's bailed on you. Peter knows that Jesus is in the storm, and he always knows that the storm is below him. He has account after account of that. And he knows that when he keeps his eyes on Christ, that he can stay above that storm too. Peter knows what it's like to be weary, and he even knows what it's like to be weary from grief, because that's what set him down in the garden as Jesus was being tempted there. When Jesus was, Father, if it be any other way, let your let this cup pass from before me, but not but not my will, yours be done. And that will always be the ultimate basis for every temptation is whose will wins. And all of that is going, this is what God really wants to do. And he goes, and let God do this. May God do this in your life as well. You're being challenged right now. You're having a hard time right now. But God is doing this. This is necessary. This is essential to complete you, to strengthen you, to establish you, and ultimately to have that foundation strong so that this walk of yours, this house that's being built of your faith in Christ will be able to withstand anything and everything. Then he says this to, to close this up. By Sylvanus, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I've written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. Before I even go further, Sylvanus is the proper name for Silas. And I know that because Paul himself will actually call Silas Sylvanus in 2 Corinthians, in the introductions to 2 Corinthians and both of the Thessalonian letters. So, Sylvanus and Silas mean woody. Kind of like, there's a snake in my boot. That's where it comes from. Well, not the snake part, but the Sylvanus, woody. 
In Acts 15, he was a leading man in Jerusalem. He was sent to validate that, that council that Peter was sort of last seen at in the book of Acts. And so they needed to take people with them so they can say this is actually a letter they didn't write on the way back. Uh, and he happens to be a prophet, as Acts 15.32 tells us. He stayed in Antioch because he saw things happening there that were so much better than what he was watching in Jerusalem. He was one, but he was the one that was arrested, beaten, and in prison with Paul in Philippi in chapter 16. He was left in Berea with Timothy in chapter 17 while Paul fled to Athens. And he will meet up with Paul as Paul finishes Athens' trip and winds up in Corinth, and they meet together in Corinth. That's Silas, Timothy, and Paul. That's pretty much the last we read of him in the book of Acts. And then somewhere in all of that, since he's already in Corinth, which is in Greece, he then seems to have gone west and now is wound up in Rome with Peter. Now, it's important to recognize that Silas appears to be an educated man. And the reason I say that is, is that 1 Peter is, is uh, infinitely more articulate than 2 Peter. Uh, as a matter of fact, it appears as if Sylvanus was, uh, in essence, editing this as Peter was speaking it. Now, that in no way interrupts or interferes with the Holy Spirit being at work here. I think God's working tandem in this situation because in 2 Peter, Silas is not there. Sylvanus is not there. And the letter happens to be a lot more like a fisherman speaking. Same information as far as... Um, there's clarity on things. There's Peter certainly bring it, writing a reminder as we begin Second Peter, God willing, next week. But he was just saying, hey, Sylvanus, our faithful brothers, I consider him, has written this. So I just want you to know it sounds a little bit different than me. You can, it's on him. Uh, and he says then, verse 13, she who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you. And so does Mark, my son. This is imperative because Mark would have been one of those people who could have been a casualty of the conflict. He was one who in Acts 15 had gone with his uh, relative, with uh, his cousin, and that is Barnabas. Uh, they went with, at the time, Paul, who was called Saul, and they went through Cyprus, which is where Barnabas was from. And then as they head into the southern coast of Turkey, Mark bails and heads back to Jerusalem to his mother's house. That would have been a person somewhere in it all it got too deep for this young guy and he bails but he seems to be restored to Paul though Paul had no interest in taking him on another mission trip by Colossians 4 Philippians 1 when Paul is in prison writing his prison letters he actually speaks of Mark as a faithful uh, fellow soldier fellow worker and then ultimately is asked for in Paul's last letter 2 Timothy 4 saying that he's useful now here's the point in it Peter says, and I can, and I can just, Peter knows what it's like to fall and have Jesus restore him. And what would it have been like if Jesus hadn't preempted that whole thing with saying, Satan has asked for you. He wants to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you that your faith would not fail. That's Luke twenty two thirty one. And here's Peter going, oh, I'm never going to fail. I'm never going to fail. You can count on me. I'm your man. I'm Rocky. And Jesus is like, you are going to fall and you're going to fall hard. However, when you have returned to me, Peter, strengthen your brother. So when Peter does fall and deny Christ thrice, Jesus will seek him out, tell the disciples and Peter, and he beelines for Peter in this and restores him. This is essential. Because then somewhere in all of this, Mark, who seems to have gotten into the ministry, it got overwhelming for him and he bailed out of it, it was too much for him somehow is wound up with a guy that would be the ultimate discipler for restoration, don't you think? And he looks at him, Peter's like, I know what it's like to be overwhelmed, to sort of succumb. And I also know what it's like to be restored and to be used. Mark, let me put you to work. And, and interesting, Mark, by the way, is his surname. John's his first name. Uh, and But you can't say John because there's enough of those in the New Testament. So we call him Mark. He happens to be, of course, the one, assumingly who, because of this relationship, interviews Peter is what a lot of people believe to give us the gospel of Mark. Nonetheless, here's the point in all of this. Peter says, you need to be sober and you need to be alert. Sober up, wake up, because there is a legitimate enemy out there who his roar, really wants to get your attention and it wants to frighten you but it can't frighten if he says give up and you're like there is no way i'm giving up see because i'm not holding on to christ he's holding on to me and i 
I'm so thankful for that. How about you? I've never in all the ministry ever been tempted to give up. Genuinely true story. However, I have watched people that I would have thought had more vim, vigor, fire, and fury than myself throw their hands up and go, this is... And I've seen some who have remained in the ministry ish but they have no hope they have no expectation and they genuinely seem to believe that everything they're doing is exclusively futile and it breaks my heart it's like Satan's chewing their foot but somehow in it they're still sort of able to sit at the pulpit and try to encourage people but it really grieves me he goes listen you need to recognize He's like, I know what it's like to face plant, and I know what it's like to be restored. Mark knows what it's like to face plant. He knows what it's like to be restored. And I want you to know that you don't have to have our experience. We'd rather you have victory throughout the entirety of it. So you need to take your stand, and that is to solid up your faith. How do I solid up my faith? Faith comes by hearing, and that the word of God. When Satan went after the one person who he couldn't defeat, that's Jesus. All Jesus used was the word. That tells me something. He didn't wait for a new spiritual experience. He didn't wait to make sure that he didn't like, if I get some angels to kick, to get some really kick in praise music, then definitely we're going to win this. Jesus knew that the one thing that slaughters the attack of the enemy is the word of God. And with that in mind, Peter goes to our last verse in this book. But please understand, he's looking at a group of people and he's going, you guys, you don't have to fall. Verse 14. Greet one another with a kiss of love. And I know what you're thinking. This is why I go to a young church. This is why I like to go to a church where all of the girls are over 30, under 30 or roughly uh, you know, and they're all cute or whatever the case is, but that is not what's being said here. I remind you, Peter's addressing people who are supposed to be treating each other like family. And in cultural context, that's how family treated family. Now, if you come from one of those families where everyone just gets drunk and beats up each other, I'm not telling you treat family like you understand family, but like you would expect family to be loving and understanding and caring and open hearted. And, and, and by the way, recognizing that they're flawed, but still loving them through it anyways. And the idea of it is, if we're going to call ourselves the family of Christ, then we should act like it. So greet each other like you greet family. Not, oh, here comes that person again. Now, maybe that's actually how you do treat family, but we really shouldn't. All that said, greet one another with a kiss of love. And then he says, peace to you, all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. As we go to prayer, beloved, here's where we start. If you've not accepted the gift of Jesus Christ, well, this is, we're, we all start in the same place, guilty in our sins, and that's how we stand before God. And we have to have something to account for that. And we could say, well, I've been nice, and I've been, you know, sometimes I've gone to church a couple times, I've prayed a few times, I've read a couple verses, you know, uh, you know I, uh, I, I've listened, I've, I've stomached a sermon someone sent me once on YouTube or whatever. Or <laughs> now you can say, well, I watched, I made it through this 40 minutes of this. But in the end of it all, it's not enough. Just the same way that you could say that I, you know, I, I, oh, so I killed a couple people, but then I actually went and took a couple police courses online. In the end of it all, please understand that God actually wants to pay your bill. He wants to clear your debt. And that is the message of the cross that Jesus is, uh, because the whole point is, is that Jesus made the choice to take your crimes in my crimes, in our hearts and in our minds, and every action we've ever done that is in any way contrary to God. And in that, he put it upon himself, all of the weight and the burden of all of that, and died on the cross so that it could be properly punished. No other religion, no other mindset offers that. And people are like, we just need to love each other. Yeah, good luck with that. On the other side of that, I can tell you this, that God so loves you, he can fill you with a love that God will pour forth through you. To love other people but first you need to receive that love yourself at the cross but remember the cross is half this story just like scripture promised on the third day he rose again and it is there now that he gives us the opportunity to receive this gift so if you've not accepted this gift i want to, to offer that to you so that today you can be delivered 
from the hands of the enemy. The one who has been devouring you with this whole issue and say, oh, you don't need to trust God. Trust yourself. Believe in yourself. Follow your heart. And God's like, no, trust me. I'm the one who died for you. I'm the one who paid your price. I'm the one who's been pursuing you. I'm the one who's kept you alive this far. I'd say that's the wisest choice to make. But if you have accepted Jesus, and tonight you're just in that place where you're going to be honest and say, man, I'm so spent. I'm so discouraged. I, I, I feel like everything that I do is futile or worse. It's obstructive to the work of God. Let's ask God tonight to rip the enemy out of any part of your mindset that tonight you could be lying free because the last thing that the that the anybody needs right now is for anyone any other Christians to somehow open their ears to try to become lion chow anymore for this. But I want to remind you, he goes like a roaring lion, but he's not a roaring lion. Let me tell you who is a roaring lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he is the king of all kings. And there is no one that's going to be able to take their stand against him. Even Satan himself, who appears to have knees, will bend them. He certainly has a mouth, and that mouth is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. And I can't wait for that day. Would you pray with me, please? And God, I want to thank you tonight for this wonderful text. For watching this cheeky, cocky fisherman become this tender-hearted disciple is a is a radical thing and I just pray tonight Lord first for the believers for those who have accepted the gift of Jesus but man life has just been rough and it's rougher because they've been listening to these lies this discouragement this division the diversions into these wrong things, the doubt, the disparagement. God, I pray tonight that you would rip the enemy out of their camp, out of their mindset, and Lord, whatever it's feeding it. Lord, I would rather us be less informed in other areas, but enemy free. If there are people in our lives that have been super sowing this into us. Relegate those relationships to where they belong. If there has been media that has been pulling up the combines and tractors and plowing and sowing doubt, tonight, shut that down. Let us make the brave choice tonight to, to say goodbye to that for good. Because we are sick and tired of watching this doubt dominate your church. So Jesus, I ask for you to take this over. Overcome this now, I pray. And tonight, I pray that you would set your disciples free. I pray they would drop, Lord, whatever that thing is. And pick up that shield of faith. That they drop things that are placating things. And pick up your word and say, God, speak to me. Increase my faith. And I pray tonight, God, that this would be the beginning of a brand new life with you. And, and finally, if there be any God right now who somehow know they haven't said yes to you or aren't sure. And again, it isn't about them having gone to church or any of that, but it is all about them having said yes to a relationship with you and the price you paid at the cross, God. By the power of your Holy Spirit, convict them right now. And if that's you, would you just pray this prayer with me right now? Let this be the beginning of a whole new life. Like you're standing at the altar at a wedding and you're saying, God... In my own merit, I'm guilty. But before you, I'm loved. And I believe you paid for me and punished all of my guilt at the cross. And at the resurrection, you offer me new life. And I say yes. So take my life. Make it yours. Make it innocent. Make it pure. Make it holy. Make it yours. As I hand myself to you now. 
In Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved, thank you. If you've prayed that prayer tonight, in a moment I'm going to flash up an opportunity. One of those um, here, you know, how you can be in contact with us. SC is in short line Calvary. SC pray number four, me. SC pray for me at gmail.com. And we really do want to keep in touch with you. And we really do want to hear from you uh, in regards to uh, when we are to reconvene. Uh, we just we really want to see kind of where you guys are at on all of this. And uh, God willing, it will be very soon. Um, also, I thought there was something else. Oh, for those of you who are Zoomers, I will sing our song. Well, in essence, dismiss. And then give us a couple minutes and then we'll reconnect on Zoom. All right. One more song. God of power and might, oh, consuming fire, you are my delight. You were my desire, oh God. Jesus. Closer than a brother, friend to all in need, everything is all that I could want to be. Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Make me more like you.
Jesus, all I want to be is like you. So our prayer tonight please set us free make us alive and make us more like you in the process we pray thank you for this beautiful book of first peter prepare us for second peter and thank you for the gift of being able to follow you another day thank you for the gift of being able to serve you another day and i pray now lord that we would all be so encouraged Remove from our hearts anything that is overwhelmed with futility, discouragement, disparagement, and replace it now with hope, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, saints. Looking forward to seeing you again very soon.